Doctor, written for radio by Douglas Young, with Ian Agnew as Nicol Naismith. Regatta. The way I see it, war is inevitable when the means to wage it exceed the will to prevent it. My name is Nicol Naismith, war correspondent and acting lieutenant HMS Collingwood. And another thing, love and war make good companions, for never have I missed a woman I love so much as now, nor, I hope, has she missed me. But then, I've had rather longer than most of my companions on this fine ship to dwell on matters of love peace and war, for my personal interest began some seven years ago, in the year 1909, when I was sent to London to report on the first reading of the Navy Bill. Even then, the wagging tongues of Parliament were not calling for peace, but relishing in advance the coming war. It is the First Lord of the Admiralty prepared to say... What estimates the board has formed as to the number of completed ships of the Dreadnought and Invincible classes which Germany will have by March 1914. Unless the German shipbuilding program is altered or expedited, the numbers will be Dreadnought 16, Invincible 5. And does the First Sea Lord believe that a superiority in these types of 20% 20% over a one-power standard is sufficient to guarantee the safety of the empire. The sooner Asquith gets Churchill out of the Board of Trade and into the Admiralty, the better, if you ask me. Seymour! <laughs> Seymour Belitho! <laughs> what on earth brings you here? The sheer pleasure of seeing politicians choking on the Admiral's demand for 60 million this year and more the next. <laughs> Asquith won't hear of it. Ah. I'm afraid my masters can be very persuasive, uh, with the help of popular sentiment, of course. Ten battles in Whitehall for every one under Briney, so it's said. These politicians just will not give us the money with good grace. You'd think it was their own. <laughs> but what of you? What brings you south? It's the basic recite I'm interested in. They're asking another five millions for expansion. I know, I know. But look. Why don't we let the Times man digest all this and we can have it for breakfast? (laughs) So tell me, what have you been up to? Seymour Belitho was the third son of an Anglo-Irish baronet and therefore cursed with appetites far exceeding his income. We had been lieutenants together on the China station, his father having decided that 12,000 miles between Seymour and the gaming tables of St James was the best way of keeping the bailiffs off his estates. He also felt that the whiff of grapeshot might stiffen his son's otherwise languid character. As it was, neither ploy had worked to any extent, but they had introduced him to a world where his manners were at least no hindrance, the world of naval intelligence, which, I was to discover, was his present occupation. It was when he took me straight from the House of Commons to the Hippodrome for an evening of novel entertainment that I began to wonder if our meeting had been entirely accidental. Uh, I didn't reserve a seat. And down here, behind the band, get the feel of the place. I've got it already. Hot and none too hygienic. Here's a good spot. What is this? Some sort of military tattoo? This is high drama. Uh, two over here, please. Rest train tonight. Never better, sir. Go bless cars a bill, I say. Away with you, my man. <laughs> here. Oh, uh, thanks. The invasion of England by airships. A peaceful village with bucolics. It is May Day and the Maypole swirls with dancers. Oh, boy. <laughs> here, listen to this. Scene two. Betrayal by a spy and attack from the sky. Good evening, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Betrayal by a spy. Now watch the crowds, man. Just watch them. How do they do that, Seymour? The, the Zeppelin with wires. Good, isn't it? Now, wait for it. Oh, oh, oh. A whole oh. bridge blown up. Oh, 
German parachutists descend on their territory. Look, look! <laughs> British troops make a timely arrival to the rejoicing of the <laughs> A great war in sin. It says here, with eventual victory by British forces. It's just as well, surrounded by this rabble. They want blood, don't they? Nothing less. There you see the monster of popular sentiment, Nickel. Enemy of reason, ally of tyrants, and the war ministry. Nightly at the Hippodrome, ordinary men and women feasted on hot pies and the spectacle of simulated war. But the passions behind their cheers and cries were real, unambiguous, and, as Seymour had rightly surmised, the property of politicians, or, in 1909, admirals. Ah, Belaito, there you are. Now, wait now. Uh, Jack, could you take over for a few frames? A uh, steward, bring some port to the window seat. Brace yourself, Nickel. Rear Admiral Palgrave, may I introduce Lieutenant Commander Nickel Naismith, Royal Naval Reserve. Uh, no point in having a naval reserve if we don't use it, eh? <laughs> sir? Uh, take a seat. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, steward. <laughs> don't let us be disturbed. Very well, Admiral. Am I to understand that I'm being called an active service, sir? Uh, Lieutenant Belitho didn't mention... I wouldn't say active, not too active at any rate. It's been four years now. Invalided out after the Nanking affair, if I'm not mistaken. A wound still giving you trouble? No, sir. A little stiffness in the shoulder, oh, that's all. Good, good. No. We're not asking you to scale the topmast. <laughs> uh, more a matter of intelligence. Ah, I see. A newspaper man on the books can't do any harm, can it? A uh, name of Sus. Lothar Sus. Mean anything? Mm, about six months ago, a German military man found sketching near a dockyard at Chatham, as I recall. Chatham. Deported under a cloud. I supposed to be on holiday. Bicycling, if you please. Set the diplomats yapping. But, sir, I have to tell you, I plan to be married later this year. I'd be most reluctant to spend time away from Edinburgh. Married? You hear that polite, though? <laughs> Get yourself into a decent club. You forget all about them. Women, that is. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> One takes a sporting interest, sir. Huh? Uh, stick to the ponies. They can kick you in the head, but it's a clean death. Oh, where were we? At this stage in my career, I feel that I you must... You didn't come in here through the tradesman's entrance. Make sure you don't leave by it. It's clear we're talking at cross-purposes here. It is because you live in Edinburgh that your services would be of most value to us. Ask him about the other fellow. Otto Fleckner. Ever heard of him? Mm. Can't say I have. What's the connection? Well, there may not be one. But then again, there may. Well, who is he, sir? Professor of Engineering, University of Hamburg. But in Edinburgh for a year on some official exchange. The students seem to like him. We've got transcripts of his lectures. All good stuff, apparently. A spy? Oh, too soon to say, but uh, we're not happy about him. For one, we can't trace his history back beyond the University of Ulm. Taught there in the academic year, 1898 to 1999. Yeah, now certain uh, irregularities have emerged connected with the dockyard at Rosyth. Mm. Uh, the port's with you, Belaitho. Sorry, sir. About a year ago, we installed a new guidance mechanism in our Whitehead torpedoes. Tricky thing, God knows how it works. We did some trials on it out of Rosyth. Now we find that the new Gottschalt device is identical. A clear copy... How did you find that out, if I may ask? We have a source inside one of their shipyards. But there's a problem on our side, too. So it would seem. We think we know the culprit. Andrew Porteous, civilian engineer. Young, idealistic, you know the type. But more to the point, he's been seen in the company of... This the... Flechner character. <laughs> no wrong. This Flechner character's wife, Anna Flechner. I see you're interested, Naismith. Cigar? So it was that over a minor proportion of a bottle of best reserve, the major proportion going to the Admiral, I came to know of Hannah Flechner and what Seymour Belitho described without conscious irony as her soigné charms. She was, so I was told, the better part of 30 years younger than her husband, who must have been around 60 years of age. 
This in itself would not have been unusual, were it not for the stream of anxious young men she had drawn into her husband's elevated circle. All had been foreign, military or diplomatic. She was known to our Berlin embassy. I was as fascinated as Seymour. And she plays the piano like an angel, Nickel, by all accounts. So you see what we're asking you to do, Nick Smith. Just to get involved. In a social sense, of course. Your position as a correspondent gives you access to many ears. I want you to make full use of them. Oh, by the way, the proprietor of your newspaper, Lucas Carnforth, has made it known to me, informally, of course, that he'd be very pleased to extend your journalistic duties in this way and that he's instructed your editor to give you rather more freedom from account than you might normally expect. But uh, uh, we in the Admiralty are ever alive to the dangers of becoming involved in political manoeuvres uh, as opposed to naval ones. The fact of the forthcoming by-election in Portsmouth should not have escaped your attention, Naismith? Of course not. Well, the fact that Lucas Carnforth is about to announce his candidacy might well have. Is he now? I believe your American colleagues call this a scoop. <sighs> Thank you. Our pleasure, Nicol. However, uh, you see a dilemma which faces us in what is, after all, a ministry of His Majesty's government. That Lucas Carnforth is a Tory. And therefore, technically at least, in the opposition camp. So you can't afford to be seen tub-thumping on his behalf. And any prospective MP for a Portsmouth constituency would rejoice in tales of a threat from the Germans. Whether it existed or not. We tread a careful line in our small department between truth and uh, the other thing. Whatever it is. They had a plan. In the second week of May, there was to be a social event of some significance at Dalmeny House, Scottish seat of the Earl of Rosebery, occasioned by the forthcoming marriage of his daughter. The social basis of the celebration ball had been widened, at the suggestion of Lord Fisher, to include many officers of the Northern Fleet, then preparing for summer manoeuvres out of the Forth, and also to include myself, my fiancée Cora, Seymour Belitho, and the suspect, Andrew Porteous. On the day, a midsummer sun lingered until late evening, when lanterns were lit throughout the exquisite parkland down to the white beach bordering the fourth estuary. Inflamed somewhat by champagne, the orchestra rose to the requirements of young love, high spirits and counterintelligence. Nickel! Nickel, free me from his clutches, please! <laughs> she dances, Nickel! She dances like a dervish. Ah, the sighing sofas of the civil service are taking their toll. He used to be a man of action, Cora. Take my word for oh, it. Oh, you are too unkind. I shall have to take to hands more often. <laughs> it's the only exercise open to a gentleman that doesn't invite ridicule. <laughs> oh, come on, Nickel. The next turn is a waltz. Even you can manage that. Only if you let me leave. <laughs> Just this once. Come on! Keep her on a tight rein and you'll be all right, eh? I'm going to skirt the Duke's domain. The place is teeming with heiresses. He lives in hope. He's very sweet, but how his eye roves. Over you? Over every female under 40. Under 50, if you're wearing enough jewellery. <laughs> oh, he doesn't change. I bet he is attractive. Some may think. Oh, jealousy is so reassuring in a man, Nickel. Aha, at last. Now that Cora is Hannah Flechner. Now I wonder where her husband is. Ah, oh, you're a German. You can tell. So quickly. It's the sibilance. You form them deeper in the throat, down here. Say, Seymour. Seymour. <laughs> there. <laughs> Seymour Belitho, ma'am. A votre service. That was the swiftest piece of gallantry I have ever known, Seymour Belitho. Hannah Flechner, Ni Meineken. That is to say... Your husband is approaching from behind with a pair of dueling swords. Oh, he hasn't <laughs> killed anyone in a duel for years. Oh, thank God for that. On the other hand, German girls find a scar or two in the left cheek most becoming in a man. 
A sign of virility. A very abstract sign, to be sure. English girls favour something more direct and less painful. And Scottish girls? Ah. <laughs> now, there's something about which I have no detailed knowledge. Uh, my friend Nicol here, on the other hand... Uh, Nicol! Cora! This way! That lovely girl is far too young for your boldness. Oh, <laughs> Frau Flechner, I'd like you to meet an old friend of mine, Nicol Naismith, and his fiancée, Cora Moncrief. My pleasure. Frau Flechner? Madam? I was just relating to Frau Fleckner how I found Scottish girls so charming. In so many words. <laughs> I apologise for anything Seymour may have said, Frau Fleckner. He sometimes runs in less than refined company, I'm bound to say. Oh, tell me more. Ah, uh, it's nothing, really. An affectation of mine. I, uh, I do love the theatre, you see. How interesting. You must tell me more, too, Mr Belitho. It would have taken a strong man to have resisted Hannah Flechner's charms had she chosen to apply them, and in these matters I knew Seymour to be pitifully weak. Cora, too, was affected by her dark beauty and forthright manner, which by rights should have claimed her a paragon among men as husband. Her husband, however, was not to be seen. Madam, you dance divinely. Thank you, kind sir. But I'm eager to meet your husband, Frau Flechner. Will he join you? I sincerely hope so. Although the present company is most pleasing. My husband, you see, is somewhat older than me and dances only with the greatest reluctance. <laughs> like Nickel. But my husband is also a Prussian. And you, Frau Flechner? Ah, I am from Turingia, a place of poetry, music, light and impoverished aristocrats. <laughs> ah. You must tell me about this place, Frau Fleckner. Perhaps while instructing me in the finer points of the Viennese Wall? She's so beautiful, Nickel. Fifty pairs of eyes are following her across the dance floor. <laughs> Seymour loves the attention more than she does. He's like a puppy at her heels. And every man here is jealous of him. Oh, dear. Could that be the only man with a right to be jealous? Ah, yes, that's him. Otto Flechner. Let's introduce ourselves. And here are two more new friends, Mr Naismith. Nickel Naismith, sir. And this is my fiancée, Cora Moncrief. Sir? A uh, pleasure. But uh, please, uh, don't let me interrupt his dance, although I'm afraid we must leave soon, Hannah. There are fireworks at midnight. Oh, that would be fun. Uh, far too late, my dear. Tomorrow I have a pressing uh, business. At the university? Your wife tells us you're a professor of engineering. A university business, yes, but in Hamburg... Again? This is becoming most tedious, Otto. I know, I know, but there's a steamship leaving early tomorrow morning and I must make preparations. We had better leave you all, then. May I call upon you, Frau Flechner? Especially if your husband is overseas. Why, yes. That would be very nice, Cora. I would like that. Flechner seemed harassed, ill at ease, wary. Not the plutocrat I had expected with a military bearing and his hands on the levers of power. Moreover, he showed no concern at all that his young and beautiful wife was swirling in the arms of a perfect stranger. At midnight... The assembled company gathered for a display of fireworks over the foreshore, and with their necks craned upward, it took a young aristocrat in his cups to stumble on a guest who made his arrival late and from the water. Oh, God! Fetch a doctor, quickly! In death, as in life, Andrew Porteous made poor company. One week later, the coroner, presiding over an inquest held in camera, determined that virtually every bone in Porteous's body was broken, although his skin was not, and that his stomach was filled not with water, but with whiskey. In the breast pocket of his jacket was a slip of paper bearing nothing but the day's date. The cause of death, the coroner speculated, was a fall from a great height into water. 
I need only add that the first span of the Great Forth Railway Bridge extends northwards from a high promontory on the Dalmeny estate within a mile of the house and that the current would bring a fallen body to the beach within an hour. Anyone who'd jump off here to take his life has to be mad. It's no question. Aye, you'd have a lot to think about on the way down. You know, I think I feel faint. Come on, let's walk back. On the other hand, if you wanted to get rid of someone, I can't think of a better way to do it. The newspapers merely deplore the lack of moral resilience in the modern generation and call for more railings. I wrote the article myself, old chap. Oh, so you did. There's nothing personal, of course. But who wrote out the date on that piece of paper? It wasn't Porteous. Whoever it was that killed him. The place was a prearranged spot they've probably used before, the, the time fixed by the train timetables. All he needed was the date. All right. Now, assuming the Germans are involved, why hurl the bounder off at all? Let's say they, they twigged that we were on to the torpedo modifications. And not knowing about our agent in Hamburg, they took it that Porteous had betrayed them. Possible. Which uh, brings us back to the Flechners. Well, you saw him arrive, Seymour. He looked as though he'd been on a forced march. Now, Porteous was seen getting onto the train at Rosyth at 9.12. He crossed the bridge here and must have got off at Dalmeny at 9.31 on time. Although we might ask ourselves what he was doing back at the base at all. And very late for the ball. Mm. After all, it's not often that junior engineer gets an invitation to one of the great houses of Scotland. Quite. So, from the station, it would have been about... What, a 30-minute walk by road to the estate? Or faster, through the woods along the headland, if you know the path. Yes, but he didn't make it. Rather, he was waylaid and in the falling light, filled up with whiskey, dragged under cover of darkness along this catwalk and heaved over. Hmm. Now, that would take more than one man, and one man he knew, to meet him at the station and suggest the shortcut. Hmm. Otto Fleckner. My guess... But he wouldn't have had time to go out onto the bridge. He needed at least half a mile to clear the shore and, and get over deep water. So, Fleckner left him with at least two other men and returned to the ball. With grassy shoes and a distinct fluster. A oh, pity there's no proof. Well, we'll just have to find some then. Ah, oh, thank God. Landfall at last. Except Fleckner then rushes off to Hamburg, leaving his beautiful wife virtually in the clammy grip of Seymour Belitho, Esquire. Well, not quite, alas. But he'd have to have a good reason to go, wouldn't he? Damned if I trust my wife with a swine like me. If these tugboatmen handle their wives like they handle my ship, it explains a lot about the women of Hamburg. I see your short acquaintance with the Charlottenburg has blossomed into affection, rust or no rust. <laughs> it's the difference between being a second lieutenant on a battleship and having command of this bucket full of rats. Yes, you're discovering at an early age that power is the greatest stimulant. Although after a long voyage, others spring to mind. Captain, a telegram from Lee. Ah. <clears throat> Damn. Trouble. Porteous? His body was washed up in front of the entire gathering at Dalmany House. Well, the tides must have turned. Oh, in God's name, von Kietmar, I leave these details up to you. The small details of murder, you mean? You know I was against this killing. We agreed he was a traitor and he died like one. My wife had his confidence. He would not have betrayed us. I hope you have as much confidence in your wife. Well, you cannot leave her behind, anyway. To return would be suicide. No. They're calling Porteous's death suicide. Well, it happens all the time from the bridge, as you know. That's why we chose it. We'll know the moment we set foot on British soil again. Even at the ball, Hannah was approached by some young officers. Oh, Professor Flechner, a woman as beautiful as your wife must be well accustomed to the attentions of young officers. Uh, uh, take me directly to the shipyard. I want to see what progress has been made. Throughout my life, only steel has served me without question. You see? 
Even the workers of Blom und Voss have excelled themselves. They must be curious to know what it is they're building. I hope security is as good as you say. Since that nest of radicals was removed, the yard has been running like a clock. Uh, nonetheless, I want you to check every worker entering the yard from now on. Check and double check. It is already arranged. Now, Weigert said it will be ready to move in two days, on schedule. At night and when the river is cleared of commercial traffic. Good. Perhaps I'm being too pessimistic. If the test goes well, we proceed as planned. And you can rejoin your wife. She will be missing you. For one so young, Cora had not failed to scent the whiff of notoriety that surrounded Frau Flechner. Eager to widen her circle, and even more so to shock her mother, she had arranged for the three of them to meet at the Edinburgh Tea Rooms on Princess Street. This was a place where a certain class of older lady could be found, and where no cake was safe. Here you are, Mama. You've been waiting long. Long enough to have consumed a buttered scorn and an eclair, regrettably. A moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. Ah, well. <laughs> Look, I just couldn't resist this. Rent and summer sale, 17 shillings. Uh-huh, it's pretty enough. Although Mistress McKeever could have run up something similar for rather less. Uh, Mistress McKeever? <gasps> Mother... This is the latest styling from France. Similar to the dress I told you Frau Flechner was wearing at the ball. Do you see the lace here? Tea. I shall decide whether or not it is decent when I see it on you. <sighs> All this for the sake of the Russians, I suppose. Oh, it's cold. Gero, another part for two. Frau Flechner will be joining us soon, will she now? A part for three and a selection of cakes. Oh, this is the occasion of the season. Count Bobinski. Oh, it's just like Tolstoy. Mrs. Wishart was telling me only the other day that an entire floor of the Caledonian has been given over to these foreigners. I'm not sure I altogether approve. Although one has to make allowances for the king's relatives, this Bobinski is related to King Edward, is he not? Oh, he's bound to be. If only through Tsar Nicholas, at the very least. Frankly, I believe there's far too much attention been paid to this visit already. Oh, in this heat, I do think cream has to be eaten quickly. I clear, Cora, you're not eating. This visit, it only gets radicals and journalists excited to no good end. Our royal family spend their summer quietly in Balmoral, and the country manages nicely. Oh, execrable noise. Are they paid, I wonder? If only Tsar Nicholas would come to Edinburgh. The Isle of Wight is quite far enough. Personally, I don't see why all these other Russians should be touring the country if the Tsar is not. But then, that's just my opinion. Diplomacy. We loan them millions of pounds, so members of their government and the aristocracy are going around saying thank you very much. Then the Tsar himself says thank you to the king. Oh, and then there's all these entente things to sign. We shall never see that money again. Either Nicholas will throw it away in another war with Japan, or the Bolsheviks will take it off him. Do you know... That's exactly what Nickel says. Where is he, by the way? Really, Cora, why you chose a man without a proper profession, I can't imagine. He won't need a profession when I'm a doctor. That's enough of that nonsense. Now, I see there are two scones left. Hello, Cora. Uh, Hannah. Oh, Frau Flechner. Oh, please, call me Hannah. Oh, I'm so glad you could come. May I introduce you to my mother? A great pleasure. Cora has already told me a great deal about you, Mrs. Flechner, all of which was most interesting. Now, won't you sit down? Thank you. Did I hear you say you were to become a doctor, Cora? I wholly approve. Really? If I had been Cora's age, I too would have chosen medicine as a profession. Oh, there you are, Mother. It's just as I said, the age of emancipation. And what, may I ask, does Nicol say of all this? Nicol is her fiancé, a newspaper man. Oh, he's against it, naturally, but then he's a man. All he needs is convincing, Cora, or persuading. Whichever gets best results. If you go on talking like this, Cora, you'll finish up with no man at all, and then where will you be? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Cora's oft-expressed desire to enter medical school was the one thing about which Mrs. Moncrief and myself shared an opinion. Hannah Flechner was, however, more attuned to the aspirations of the age, which I, concerned with matters I thought more important, dismissed lightly. 
My desk ran over with the ebb and flow of world affairs. In Morocco, the French and the Germans squabbled over the empty throne of a sultan. In Persia, a Cossack army was marching to the assistance of the Shah, much to the visible disquiet of the Foreign Office, who, in a frenzied torrent of protocols, were preparing for the arrival of His Imperial Highness Tsar Nicholas, Emperor of all the Russias and Master of domains vast and mysterious beyond all imagining. That other Emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm, viewed this visit with distrust. The alliance of Britain and France was a danger. An alliance of Britain, France and Russia was a potential catastrophe. In their extremity, the Germans had embarked upon a programme of naval rearmament, second only to our own. Within Germany, the Flottenverein, the Navy League, was exerting a strong grip on both the popular imagination and the politicians. Within the Navy, cadres of young officers were forming, eager to exercise their newfound power, impatient of the whiskered diplomats and their stiff-legged waltzing. Now, to put theory into practice. It seems a pity to destroy all that effort. This destruction is the purpose of that effort. Are all the men clear? Yes. Well, then, I think you should do this, Yetmar, to get the feel of it. My pleasure. Beigert, we are ready. Perfect. <laughs> I think so. Yes, perfect. You may inform Admiral Gerst of the results. At least we know it can be done. Uh, with several tons of explosive. But thanks to our departed friend, Mr. Porteous, the British will provide all that we need at the right time and at the right place. Yes, the plan does have a certain appeal to my sense of the ironic. Uh, you have the operational details well in hand, I trust? The Charlottenburg is already loaded. Good. We can return to Leith. <laughs> I'm quite looking forward to this regatta. As a matter of fact, I think our oarsmen will have the day. Perhaps they will give us a trophy. <laughs> Come. Anything wrong, sir? About this Porteous business. Read this. Hmm, from Carnforth. Yes. Dined with the Foreign Secretary last night. Oh, damn. Carnforth asked me to give you leeway with your time, Naismith, and I know you're involved in some admiralty business, that's all. But he wants to publish more about Porteous. He wants to open his campaign for Portsmouth East with a naval broadside. It's difficult for me to refuse him. He's a man of high ambition and high office is what he wants. If there's one time when the national interest and that of Lucas Carnforth don't coincide, this is one of them. Once this gets into the boulevard press, anything can happen. I trust the worthy organ which pays your salary is not included within that subricate. Boulevard or not, the public must find its voice. With Carnforth as the ventriloquist. He owns this newspaper, Naismith. Well, I don't trust him. And I have my doubts about the Foreign Secretary, too. What are you saying? They're old friends. That combination of official ignorance and Carnforth's greed can lead to disaster when it involves the manipulation of military intelligence for personal gain. Especially when greed is dressed up as patriots. If the Foreign Office is prepared to divulge the work of German agents in this murder, then I, for one, would not want the Daily Mail to steal a mark. Are you sure that Carnforth didn't wish the whole thing to happen? It's awfully convenient, you know. Now, just a question, Naismith. Are you actually suggesting that he's in league with the Germans? No. But he knows a lot. And a man in his position would have no scruples in cutting the German cloth to suit his own coat. Preposterous! Would-be politicians are capable of anything. There's some truth in that. All right, but I can't sit on this forever. Oh, thanks. Have you ever thought of opening the windows? This warm weather's killing. Ah, oh, the nights will be drawing in soon enough. Let them be. Uh, well, I'll get on with that piece about flying the channel, then. If you think there's a story in it... A month on the fat stock prices of the risen. I'll hold you to that. I'll hold you to that. Oh. Uh, oh. Good morning, Frau Flechner. <laughs> What a pleasant surprise. Good morning, Herr Naismith. Forgive me dropping in on you like this. I was in the area. Would you, would you like some tea? 
I was rather hoping that you would accompany me on a short walk. The day is so lovely. Why, with, with pleasure. To the castle? A Highland regiment put the fear of death into anyone, in particular when they're off duty. They're so brown. Have they just returned from India? South Africa. Ah, still suppressing the Boers after all these years. Well, we see it from a different perspective. I'm sure you do. I only know Kaiser Wilhelm took great exception to the harsh treatment of white settlers by your colonial army. What a view! What island is that? Inchkeith. Uh, the smaller one is Cramond Island. And there's the railway bridge. So many ships. Well, Leith is the fifth port of the kingdom. Takes a lot of traffic. Do many people throw themselves off the bridge? More than you'd think. Its construction was an inspiration to suicide all over Scotland. Oh, don't. Yeah, it's part of the way we accept progress into our culture. In the East, it's different. When I was in China, an old princess took her life by breathing in gold leaf, suffocated by a film of gold inside the lungs. And that's what I call a noble death. You knew Porteous, didn't you? But through my husband only. He was an engineer too. Of course. He lacked, how do you say, social graces. I gather he was an odd sort. A pacifist, so they say. Really? And yet he gave his services to the Royal Navy. Who knows for what motives? But you knew that? I believe my husband said so. Still, a death is a death. Now, shall we wait for the time gun? I do love the sound of artillery at close range. Our walk in the esplanade high above the city lasted the whole afternoon. At the end of it, I had managed to glean virtually no useful information from this beautiful woman, whereas she left in possession of most of my life history. Against my better judgment, I saw her again once, then twice, then once again in the following week, whereupon my interest in her background changed imperceptibly into an interest in her. I've always adhered to the military proverb that advises you to keep in front of a horse, behind a cannon, and out of earshot of superior officers. Alas, one week after my first interview with Hannah, as I now called her, I was recalled to London. You know, Van Siddard has an electric fan in his office. Got the idea in Egypt. Do you think we could requisition one? From the Indian Army? Huh. They'd send you a punker waller and a piece of string. Well, it's worth a memo. See to it while the weather holds, then I might get one before I retire. Yes, sir. Come. Ah, there you are, Naismith. Hope we lost you. No, I'm sorry, I'm late, sir. The, the train was held up at York. You take a seat. You look puffed. <laughs> All those stairs. Belitho here tells me you've been spending some time with Frau Fleckner. Any results? Well, not much, sir. She seems, uh, how can I put it... Distracted, although not unfriendly. Yeah, what does she say about Fleckner? Very little. I'd say they don't get on with each other. Well, no surprises there. Uh, fill him in, Baraito. Yes, sir. Um, Hannah, Countess von Sachs Meinigen. Slip of the tongue at Dalmeny put me onto it. What? I can't see how we missed it before. What were our chaps doing in Berlin, <laughs> I wonder? Opera, probably. They make a meal of it over there. <laughs> well, it changes things somewhat, since she's on a direct, if tenuous, line to the Kaiser. Her uncle is a mediatised Prince of Thuringia, Principality of Royce, older line. Mm. Oh, it's all in the Almanac de Gotha, if you care to look. So, what's she doing tucked away in old Ricky, eh? Exactly. Especially when we consider Otto Fleckner. Now, go on. Well, we finally got him through his military academy yearbook, 1868. Look, there he is, third from the left, see? Mm, that's him. Mm, well, could be. That's the same man, no doubt. Gazetted 1869. The thing is, a year later he distinguished himself while only a callow subaltern of engineers at the siege of Metz. Apparently the Prussians had almost invested the city when he cut off all lines of retreat for the French army by blowing up every way out of the city in one night. Railways, roads, canals. Mentioned in dispatches, Eisenkreutz, and a big boost up the ranks to Lieutenant Colonel in ten years. So when did he take up an academic career? Well, coming to that, as far as we can see, he disappeared from active service in 1884 after a stint in the colonial service in Tanganyika. 
Mm. In fact, we even turned up a mention of him in our dispatches, read the East African Railway. The Germans didn't like the idea of a British railway from Cairo to the Cape, and <coughs> had plans of their own, his plans. Anyway, not much came of that until we hear that he was involved in the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, too. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be 1888 or so, as an engineer attached to the legation. <laughs> he got around, it seems. Yes, but in what capacity, hmm? The next? Well, then nothing until Ulm. Quiet university town, suddenly he becomes professor. And all the odds are on a diplomatic or government career. Then Hamburg. Mm, three years later, in 1902, Professor of Structural and Marine Engineering and a director of the Blomen Voss mm. shipyard to boot. Mm. Well, by this time he was married, must have been at the turn of the century. Oh, she'd be in her early 20s. And he adopted no honorary titles. None. <laughs> Damned if I'd let that pass if I bagged a countess, eh? <laughs> <laughs> he's a very good, sir. <laughs> he's, a, he's certainly no socialist. So why not? Well, I think he was inducted into military intelligence in Africa and has been there ever since. And he's been keeping his head down. So is she. A spy, you mean? Well, look at Porteous. Although she admitted to knowing the man. Well, through her husband. Oh, there you are, the pair of them. But what are they up to? Well, we're still waiting for our man's report from Hamburg. He's following Fleckner like a bloodhound. I hope. Meanwhile, something even more interesting has turned up. <laughs> You had planned to attend the regatta on the Firth of Forth in honour of the Russians? Oh, of course. No Navy man would miss that. Well, there should be a good turnout. Winslow is held over the Northern Fleet at Rosyth before bringing it down to the Solent for the Royal Review. Never misses a chance to impress foreigners. <laughs> Why do you ask, sir? <clears throat> and the guest list repays careful study. Ah, the Flechners. And now, with the Russians aboard the Polar Star when it arrives in the Firth? Oh, the best part of the government, by the look of it. Livovsky, Polovanov, Gushkov. He's the one who might buy a battleship or two with the money we've just loaned them. Oh, the whole visit's a big thank you for the 90 millions kindly donated to the Imperial Treasury by the British taxpayer. But look at the minor players, look. Babinski. Ever heard of him? Paul Babinski. Count Paul. Mm -hmm. Age 29 and a gay dog, if ever there was. Inherited a fortune at 21, three seasons in Monte, and at the end of it, not enough to keep a draper's clerk for a week. Ah, there was some scandal. Who was it? Ah, that's right. Found a source of funds in the widow of a Paris financier who absconded with a wad of Panama Canal capital and then hurled himself out of a third-floor window of the Hotel des Bains Biarritz. <laughs> ah, but not before he converted half the loot into jewellery for his nymph-like mistress, <laughs> which was promptly claimed by said widow, who turned the lot over to our man Babinski in return for one unspecified favour. He going about. Now, more to the point, what possessed her to marry an old windbag my age? Answer me that, huh? <coughs> and another thing, when I hear of Russians and Germans linked in any way, I begin to hear alarm bells. Has anyone counted the size of their combined fleets recently? <laughs> big. Very big. Mm. Here's a, a letter of introduction to an old friend of mine, Vasily Nezhdanov. He's second secretary at the Russian embassy. I want you to go and have a word with him. At the embassy? Of course. Now, he'll give you a lazy passé to all the social and diplomatic portals between here and St. Petersburg, if necessary, and a lot more besides. I've booked a table at the Café Monaco at eight. A spot of dinner, then the night's Lieber North. What else besides, sir? And yes, Smith, there are things that even I don't want to hear about officially. He's expecting you at six. Well, we pick up the Leith pilot in two hours. After that, no turning back. Into history or oblivion, von Yetmar. It reduce speed until we hear from Admiral Gerst. Slow ahead, bearing 20 degrees port. Slow ahead, bearing 20 degrees port. Well, at least the weather is with us. And the force of change, Herr Professor. Well, Twenty years ago, the British would have laughed at a challenge from the German fleet. Today, they are building furiously to keep a pace. It's now or never. Our advantage is mainly psychological. On paper, they could still overwhelm us. On paper, yes. Which is why surprise is our major weapon. And intrigue. Ah, I leave these matters to you. Despite my relative youth, I prefer to seek honours in battle the old way. Uh, the old way is becoming a luxury, alas. 
Ah. Signal from Admiral Gerst, Captain. <sighs> At last. The fleet is in position, waiting for our signal. So, the High Command won over the politicians at long last. Head for Leith. And your wife, Herr Professor. Yes, my wife. Full ahead, bearing 20 degrees starboard. Oh, that's a beautiful... Oh, terrible. Oh, terrible. Oh, terrible. Oh, well, <laughs> Oh, if only I could play like that. For at least on one hand is my limit. <laughs> oh, I hardly play now, Cora. Once. But, ach, oh, well, now it's your turn. Can you sing? Mm, a little. A tune, come on. <laughs> um, in a Persian garden, do you know it? I think so. Like this? Yes, that's, that's it. it. That's ah, it. That's good. good. Right. Uh, now wait. You must practice, that's all. <laughs> practice? <laughs> Twenty oh, years dear. of it, maybe. <laughs> ah, Otto has arrived. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'd better go home. Oh, no, why don't you stay? You could take supper with us. There's so much to talk about, Cola. We would love to have you. We distinguish good diplomacy from bad by the results obtained and the price paid. I was now a cut-price diplomat with little idea of the results to be gained from my mission. The cab rolled across a sun-dappled Berkeley Square and dropped me in front of Chesham House, the building that housed the Tsar's representatives in suitably imperial style. In anticipation of the Tsar's forthcoming and historic review of the fleet at Spithead, the embassy was in a state of near hysteria. My letter gained me an entrance and brought Nizhdanov out to meet me in a cathedral-like hall. Nizhdanov was a small man who sported a wayward Van Dyke and who, as a concession to the heat, had dressed himself in the manner of a beach photographer. He led me across a marble floor to a quiet office overlooking the embassy garden. My haven. Uh, please, take a seat. A cigar? Oh, thank you. And you will be wondering why you are here, Mr. Naismith. Admiral Polgrave, an honoured friend, recommended your services. Services? Hmm. Hmm. Turkish? From Bahara. A gift from the Khan, uh, whom I saved from the British. Eh? An unusual piquancy, don't you think? Hmm. Certainly not Havana. Grown in the neighbourhood of horses, I fancy. Services of uh, an extra-diplomatic nature. To whom, may I ask? To... Uh, to peace. Yes, peace in Europe. Peace is a hard master, sir. <laughs> and the nature of these duties? You know, I cannot keep my eyes off these chrysanthemums. So English and yet so oriental. I have seen them in the foothills of the Himalayas, like the burning bush, flaming red. What I'm about to say to you could have me shot. You too, I fancy. I'll take that risk. Good. His Majesty Tsar Nicholas II is a fool. His wife Alexandra is a superstitious virago, also profoundly stupid. The imperial family is prey to every sort of opportunist, quack and mountebank it is their misfortune to meet. In Russia itself, this has encouraged an almost constant state of insurrection amongst all classes, from laborers upwards. Abroad, it has allowed Kaiser Wilhelm to stimulate a disastrous war with Japan, and so they sent among Russia's allies. Only recently, the fool placed his signature on a treaty with Germany which would have provoked an immediate war with France, had not Count Vitti intervened. Not to mention war with us. <laughs> the man was on a yachting holiday, and he takes a morning off to plunge Europe into war. I think the Foreign Office prefer to pretend it didn't happen. Ah, thank God they do. That's why this visit is important beyond all calculation, 
and why no unfortunate events must disturb the soothing flow of platitudes. Events such as what? Assassination? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, that has been tried, but the enemies of Russia now realize the Tsar is their greatest ally. No. Uh, there is evidence, the details of which I need not burden you with, that a group of noblemen and others not so noble plan to grasp the levers of power now held in the rather palsied hands of the Tsar's closest advisors while he is abroad. There is also evidence of German hands in this affair, although at what level we can't be sure. Certainly close to, if not the Kaiser himself. Uh, however, I am satisfied that the Germans are unaware of the extent of my knowledge, or that their collaborator, Count Bobinski, is under suspicion. Ah, Bobinski. A friend of a friend, I believe. Yes. Hannah Flechner, so I'm told. Ah, uh, the beautiful Hannah Flechner, so disarmingly charming. I find her so. Oh, she is, she is. For a young man, doubly so, I venture. What is my role in this, Nezhdanov? I see none, other than to spy on Frau Flechner. You are to be a messenger, to carry this letter. The Imperial Seal. Correct and deliver it to Count Bovinsky at the reception, if you receive the signal to do so from Admiral Paul Grave. And if not? You will destroy it that night. May I ask for a content? Let me just say that upon its receipt, Count Bovinsky will, if he is truly of noble blood, return to his room and put a pistol to his temple. So guard it with your life, and do not leave it out of your possession for even one moment. Very well. But why me? Because, Mr. Naismith, you are no one. If I make a mistake, diplomacy is compromised. If your government makes a mistake, there is war. If you make a mistake, it is unfortunate. I left Nezhdanov with the letter bearing the imperial seal burning a hole in my pocket and made my way to the Café Monaco which was then enjoying the custom of both the bowl and demi-monde. I found Seymour at a corner table, enjoying the company of two girls, the staple of whose business was romance at short notice. They were drinking his champagne, smoking his Doretzkas, and generally sharing in the cultivated air of a young gent squandering his substance on fast women and slow horses. To his great distress, and theirs, I insisted that the young ladies leave us. It all. Chap's got to relax in the best way he knows how, hasn't he? I've got the letter. Uh, waiter, another glass. Yes, sir. Now, listen, do you know this Nezhdanov character? Well, only by repute. Secret service, of course. A Crano Delaney, or whatever they call it. Very unsavory lot. He gave me this letter. They're very pretty, those two. Doubtful fame, perhaps, but then you've not been reticent with Frau Heckner, have you? There you are. More champagne, sir. Oh, yes, I think so. Don't you, Nicole? And uh, the menu, please. Very good, sir. Seymour. Well, if we must. Uh, what do you think of these? Hmm. It's an odd drawing. What is it? I wish I knew. Just arrived from Hamburg by courier. Well, it's big enough, whatever it is. Look at the scale. A crane, perhaps? Now, apparently it was built by Blom and Voss in great secrecy, and then when Fleckner arrived, it was towed out to sea and uh, blown up. Blown up? Hmm. I thought perhaps some sort of floating dock. And they were testing it? Well, either it went wrong, or they wanted to see how much it could take. Who knows? Well, did our agent have any idea? I haven't heard from him since. Uh, but we did hear something interesting from St. Petersburg, by way of Paris. What next? It came in shortly after you left. Our embassy people are touchingly reticent to pass on personal details, but uh, Count Babinski was recently in trouble with gambling debts. There's nothing worse, believe me. Not a thing to show for it, you see. Oh, come uh, on. Well, one of our junior secretaries out there put him on to a supposed uncle who paid the embarrassment off by banker's draft originating in Paris. Uh, originating, in fact, from Lucas Carnforth. One of our embassy staff? No, just a new boy in for a guinea. We'll get him moved on. But as you see, Carnforth isn't without influence, uh, even in Mother Russia. Carnforth and Babinski. Babinski and Hannah. Hannah and Fleckner. Who's the dog and who's the tail? Difficult, eh? 
gentlemen. Ah, thank you. Uh, Nickel, some rich eating before we brave the railway? Shall we order? I don't want to be any trouble here, Von Yetmar. <laughs> trouble? It is my pleasure. Uh, good night, Frau Plessner. Herr Professor? Good night. And it was lovely having you, Cora. Uh, see that she returns home safely. But of course. Driver! You're using her, Otto. Oh. I won't tolerate it. All night the two of you were feeding her that nonsense about medical school. Yet Mar and the girl find each other attractive. Even I can see that. And it's very convenient for you, my dear, isn't it? Have you been having me followed? You prig. I asked you to gain Naismith's confidence, not access to his bedroom. How dare you! And not for the first time, Contessa. But always in my name. As my wife, protecting the name of a flea-bitten family of syphilitic princes and royal whores. I married you because men like you were shaping the new Germany, while men like my uncle were dreaming of the old. And what little a woman could do, I did. With relish, it seems. By God, I was wrong. Petty intrigues. With cockerels like von Yetmar. I to think Bismarck himself once pinned medals on your chest. Uh, not so petty, my dear. And if the Kaiser himself doesn't honor both Yetmer and myself, then we have failed and only them. Honored? For what? Driving a Scottish traitor to suicide and seducing a schoolgirl? Suicide? Do you think we're running a sanatorium here for drunks and weaklings? Yetmar threw him off. I thought he was wrong at the time, but now I know better. Good God. And why do you think Naismith is of interest? Because he is close to opinion and naval policy. British naval policy is perfectly clear, Han. It's to build a navy that will crush Germany unless we crush them first. Now, read this. What is this? It's a message transmitted from Naval High Command in Wilhelmshaven to von Yetmar on his ship by a wireless apparatus. A British spy has been captured in the shipyard. He's being questioned. Spying on you? Quite possibly. We've yet to establish whether he's passed information back to London, but what we do know is that Nickel Naismith visited the Naval Intelligence Headquarters in Whitehall, and from there he went straight to the Russian Embassy this afternoon. Why? Well, if I knew that, I would sleep more easily. In particular, since Vasily Nejdanov has taken over security at the Embassy. <laughs> now, there's a man your Bobinsky has reason to fear. Bobinsky? Is that why you asked me to see him after all these years? You're using me to trap him. Trap him? Well, hardly. Babinski's now rather more than the court pop in J.U. knew in Meinigen. He's acquired ambitions beyond the bedspreads of heiresses, although you do seem to be the exception, my dear. Why is he coming here? He's coming here because he's the one Russian nobleman close to the Tsar that in time of extreme emergency can be relied upon to express the German point of view to our great advantage. Advantage? This peace is costing our fatherland its rightful place among nations. It's time for change. And either Germany is the hammer of Europe, or it will be the anvil. You're talking of war, Otto. Just what are you scheming with von Yetmar? Oh, you will know soon enough. Otto, my patriotism has its limits. Then we must ensure you do not exceed them. Do you really think it's possible, Friedrich? Of course. Uh, in Freiburg, there is already an entire class of female students. Well, far from being unusual, it is almost fashionable. Uh, and I speak German quite well. Uh, I foresee problems with your fiancé. Oh, him. Let him wait. Well, if I were him, I wouldn't. Wouldn't you? I would come with you, Cora. You know, I think you would, Friedrich. Um, this is my house... Thank you for bringing me. Uh, Cora, hmm? can I see you again? Uh, alone, I mean. Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, goodbye, Friedrich. Goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> Cab, gentlemen. 
Oh, yes, oh. thank you. Uh, King's Cross. No, wait, wait, wait. Look up there, man, the starry welkin. Uh, now, how often do you see that over London? Hey, come on, I'm for a stroll. Oh, come on, Nicole. Oh, you're right, yeah. Well, walk. No, no. Very good, sir. Oh, God, Nicole. Don't you feel on top of the world? <laughs> As though you could do anything and achieve whatever you wanted. A few years ago, I used to feel like this all the time. <laughs> there speaks a magnum of Giesler's. <laughs> oh, no. Well, not only that. But you must have felt it, too. Mm. Well, not even in China. Well, did our bloody feet nickel. Did we care about money, position, marriage, Lady Bloody Caroline Files? <laughs> Oh, give me a Shanghai courtesan any day. You can tell her mother that from me. <laughs> oh, Harridan. God, here we go again. You lead a charmed life, Seaboard. Be thankful. Oh, come on, you drafty ass Scots. What? <laughs> Admit that just occasionally, perhaps only once in a lifetime, all the pleasures and excitements and an exaltation you might ever know can be distilled into a few remarkable moments. Look at Gordon in cartoon. Gordon? He got a spear in the chest for his troubles. But the glory, man. Written in legend. No, not a price I'd pay, old man. Wouldn't you? Of course you would. So would I. So would a million men if they were asked properly. I might yet be. How's that? In your pocket, Nickel. A piece of history. Who knows what forces that piece of paper contains? Have you thought of that? The power of a few words. And these plans, what do they mean? You think all this is that important? A million men, Nickel. A million men. Quiet. If someone's following us. Well, what did I tell you? Someone thinks it's important. Shh. Now stop walking when I do. You hear that? You may be right. What's up ahead? Uh, alleyways leading to the river. Oh, Marvellous. Better head round here. Where in God's name did that come from? Does it matter? Round the corner. Come on. Good Lord. Dead. Shot in the head. Who is he? God knows. Nine millimeter Browning. Belgian made. Could mean anything. I'd better get the police. I'd better not. Leave him. You can't see more. Come on, Nickel. Ah. I needed that. Not often you find a perforated corpse so soon after a meal. I wonder who he was. Well, I dare say the police will come through with the name in their own time. It was a trap. There was someone ahead of us and someone behind. But some kind soul sprang it for us. Keeping their eye on the Imperial property. As any. So the dead man could be a German. Or one of Khan Force ruffians. Wouldn't surprise me in the least. The man's a rank opportunist. The man's a disgrace. Lives are at stake. Two so far. Will you excuse me, Nickel? It's something I must arrange. pistols of uncertain vintage from a gunsmith in Clerkenwell who held his family's account. On arriving in Edinburgh the following morning, we walked the short distance to the new club in Princess Street, where Seymour availed himself of a guest room to recover from a sleepless night at the hands of the North British Railway. My first task was to deposit Nezhdanov's letter in the club's safe. This done, I called upon Cora, and taking advantage of the fine weather, we took a coach and four to the fourth at Cramond, in the company of English tourists come to admire the rail bridge. My plan was to take a light lunch at the Hawes Inn and then hire a sailboat for a pleasure cruise. Cora had demanded that we speak alone, always a sign of trouble, and a boat trip satisfied this demand, as well as my curiosity to see the great bridge from beneath, the bridge whose spidery pylons drew ever-changing patterns over the blue sky as our small craft sailed into its giant shadow. To port! No, the other way! Which way? The sail is pulling us backwards! Duck! Ow! Sorry! Nickel, you're trying to drown me! There, that's better. Tacking always takes a bit of getting used to. Other ships, a 
not in the middle? Oh, I think we can avoid a steamship without much trouble. Oh, I never could stand water. We'll go round Hound Point and under the bridge. No! That's dangerous! Thirty minutes there, ten back. You still haven't told me about London. What kept you there that was so interesting? No more than you would imagine. Oh, but not Hannah Flechner. Hannah? Why do you ask? Well, she told me nothing, but Friedrich told me everything. Who in God's name is Friedrich? A friend of the professor. Very young. A merchant captain. Friedrich who? Friedrich von Jetmar. And handsome isn't the word. What did Friedrich tell you? That you had visited Hannah privately. Did he tell you how he knew this? But you admit it just like that? Well, of course I admit it. There was a reason. Ah, oh, I know your reasons. Hers, I can't imagine. What did this Yetmar want, then? Von Yetmar. Oh, the usual, but in the most charming manner. Cora! I don't blame you, though. She is beautiful. Who's blaming who? He asked about me, didn't he? Mainly about me, as a matter of fact. About my plans to become a doctor, for example. Oh, God, not that again. Oh, Nicol, let's turn back. The Bellerophon! Coming in! What a sight! Wait for the bow wave! I want to go back right now! <laughs> if Seymour were here now, he'd be hanging over the side. You never had fight his sea legs. Ooh. Ah, clear of the headland. Nickel! Now the breeze can do its job. Nickel, hold on! <laughs> and damn me if we weren't almost in a drink. The wash on the Bellerophon took us amidships. <laughs> Serves you right, Nickel, for messing about in a sailboat with a young girl. I wasn't messing about. Oh, go on. What of a, a reconnoitre? You're still contemplating marriage, eh? I thought you and Hannah Fleckner were getting pretty thick, if you don't mind me saying. Do you want another? Naval reconnaissance. You know, binoculars, that sort of thing. I'm suddenly not happy about this regatta. Well, socially, it could be better. The Bellerophon steaming into Resythe brought Port Arthur into mind. A yeah, nasty business. Never catch us like that. The entire Russian fleet in the Pacific tied up at harbour, and a few Nipponese torpedo boats got a lot of them in a matter of minutes, not hours. All that ironmongery at Resythe is a tempting target. There's no doubt about that. Especially when half the northern fleet's waiting around for the regatta. Mm, and the rest is pottering about in the Solent. Exactly so. The Germans know where our fleet is and what it's doing. Do think they dare? Well, I don't. Not that. Slip a few torpedo boats in behind the bridge under cover of darkness? Under cover of the regatta? Well, the only German warship that's been invited is the Hagen. There's no threat from that, mm. old Tom. No, you're right there. Still, I'm uneasy about the whole thing. Well, Fleckner might be up to something really big, uh, but I see him as more of a schemer, a planner, a dreamer. And Paul Gray is still more interested in naval secrets leaving the dockyard. I think there's someone else. Oh? Friedrich von Jettmer, merchant captain. He's been seeing Cora, asking about me. And has he now? Well, Cupid has been a busy little fellow around these parts, hasn't he? Can you telegraph Paul Gray for a check on him as soon oh, as possible? Will do. Strapping Hun, is he? Or do lay off seal. <laughs> yeah, telegram for Mr. Belito. Oh, here, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. You know, as provincial clubs go, the new club is quite tolerable. It has that decomposed feel of the Garrick, but a well-preserved aesthetic sense. Oh, no. What? From Paul Grave. Our man's turned up in the free port. So they found him? In the canal. He was pushing his luck, you know. Yes, Geoffrey Brabant. I knew him quite well. In fact, I've still got a set of his polo clubs. So someone means business. Let's now want to see Hannah, while well, you cable London and get all the information you have on Friedrich von Jettmer. He's probably a Navy man. I wonder... I wonder if he talked. Oh, do they hate music that much? <laughs> no. I think they love music, but hate their audience. Sometimes I see their point. Well, in Vienna, they would be shocked. In Vienna, we would be notorious lovers. Oh, is that the promise? There is a, how do you say, a stimmung here? Atmosphere. Yes, an atmosphere that discourages notoriety in love. In Edinburgh, we would be shot for that sort of thing, I mean. What sort of thing? Well, I'm sure I don't know what you mean. You know. 
know, Friedrich, you know perfectly well what I mean. Not personally, of course. I don't believe you. <laughs> well, perhaps. A little adventure here and there. An adventurous? Oh, did you see that Coraman Creef with a foreigner and her father a judge and elder besides? <laughs> and a fiancé as well, who takes her on romantic sailboat trips on the river. Romantic? Nickel has no concept of romance. Oh, I'm sure you're being too hard. Not at all. We argued most of the time, and then he nearly had us drowned by a battleship. About what did you argue? About you. You told him everything? Yes, well, almost. About going to Germany? He thinks I'm dreaming. And are you? No, I'm going. And your marriage to... What marriage? So you are serious. Of course I am. Why do men never take me seriously? Well, I do. I hope so. Then I hope you did what I asked you. Are all lovers so interested in their rivals? Nickel was asking me about you two. What exactly? Who you were, what you were doing here and so on. I suppose it's only natural. Did he tell you why he was in London? Of course not. I didn't ask him. Why are you so interested? But you sailed close to the Fort Bridge. Right under it, almost. Where the racing and the shipboard ball are to be held. That's right. Do you think the British teams will have an unfair advantage? Uh, no, my men are well prepared. I can believe that. More tea? Uh, no, my dear, I have to see Professor Flechner. Immediately? I'm afraid so. <sighs> Maybe you and Nicola are alike after all. Mr. Naismith, madam. Hello, Mr. Naismith. What a pleasant surprise. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh -huh. Nicole, what are you doing here? Is your husband at the university? Yes. Oh, good. They call this is dangerous. No, this is dangerous. I have to ask you about your husband. Is he involved in some sort of military work here in Scotland? How can I tell you that? You don't know or you can't tell. You realise what you are asking? You can betray a husband in more ways than one. Or a fiancé. Touché. What about Count Babinski? Ah, so you are a spy. Otto was never sure. Have you used me too? Every word I've said to you has been the truth, Hannah. And now Cora knows it too. Oh, dear. Bobinski? We were lovers once. The handsome Count and the pretty Countess. You knew that too. Why is he coming to Britain? I'm not sure. He is close to the Tsar's advisers now, and he is ambitious. What connection does he have with your husband? If I know Paul, financial. I met my husband when we were lovers. It started then. What? Otto became infatuated with me, and he bought Paul's speedy departure. But your husband was never rich. I now know that it was never his money. Ah, so Babinski traded his eyes and ears in exchange for a remittance each month from Berlin. Uh, he never could resist the trappings of luxury. Even now, I'll wager he hasn't two pennies in his pocket. Oh, don't worry. He has other sources. Paul is weak. He is easily used. He is easily used. But why? There are some who would like to change the alliances of Europe in a spectacular fashion. I think what we are talking about is war. It may be. Then I will help you. Wait. Listen. It's von Yetmar. I want to look at him. Go, Nicole. Out to the garden, quickly. Go. Tomorrow, at the regatta, Hannah. And promise you won't tell your husband I've been here. Be careful. Go. That night, Seymour provided the information I had expected. Von Yetmar was no merchant captain, but had served as lieutenant in the Schlesien, one of Germany's most powerful warships. The director also arrived from Polgrave. I was to hand Bobinski the letter. Next day, the day of the regatta, the sun drove away a fine haze and an impatient breeze snapped pennants, riffled through programmes and tore at caps and bonnets clamped in place by a thousand hands. The day began with yacht racing over a course reaching far out into the estuary and nearer to the anchored ships, teams of burly men sculled for silver cups. What's your bet? I've got two shillings on the Frenchman. Oh. Well, thighs like tugboats, man. Traitor. I'm on the men from the Ramelines. Oh, no chance. Oh, I just like the look of them. Look, Nicole. I don't understand it. Where did that red and black skiff come from? Hmm? 
Ah, they're von Yetmer's men from the Charlottenburg. Well, frankly, I'm not too keen on all these Germans sculling about our boats. Oh, neither am I. You did bring your gun. Yes. Did you? Yes. Although I don't think a shootout is quite what Palgrave had in mind. <laughs> oh, he would not be pleased. And this pistol feels like a leg of lamb in my pocket, by the way. I hope I won't be expected to dance like this. <laughs> that might make the wrong impression for sure. Oh, they're under the bridge already. Now, let's see if we can gain on the turn. Our thoughts were further concentrated by the arrival of the official party from the Russian Imperial yacht. The afternoon of racing gave way to a ball on board HMS Magnificent, a doughty old ironclad whose warped decks were as ill-suited to the waltz as to warfare. Her guns, hung with bunting and the flags of many nations, formed a canopy against the sun and spray, under which young officers met their girls as bright as jewels set in grey gunmetal. At six, a toast was drunk to Louis Blériot, who had finally succeeded in crossing the English Channel. At eight, the Russian guests were released from the grip of protocol, and the ball began. Nicole Seymour, why aren't you dancing? Come on. Cora, have you seen the Flechners? They're with the Russian party. They'll be here shortly. Brace yourself, old boy. Got the letter? Have I got the letter? What's letter, Nickel? I'm afraid I'm only the postman. Where's your friend Von Yetmer, by the way? I'd like to meet him. All right, then you will. Ah, uh, Professor Hannah. Uh, Herr Naismith and um, Seymour Belitho. We've met. Of course, at Lord Rosebury's estate. Uh, gentlemen and Cora, I would like you to meet Count Paul Bobinski, nephew of the Grand Duke Vladimir, and an old acquaintance of my wife. I wish I could count this meeting a pleasure, gentlemen. Count Bobinski, this letter has been entrusted to me by a representative of His Highness the Tsar. What is this? Flechner, explain. Uh, disregard it. The Imperial Seal. It's a piece of wax. After all, ignore it. Honor demands it, Paul. Hannah, you have betrayed me. I betrayed myself, Otto, for too long. Take the letter, Babinski. Why are you doing this? Whatever part you and Herr von Yetmer have played in this affair, Professor, it's over. What affair is this? We believe there is evidence to link your activities with the death of Andrew Porteous. And you believe? The... Evidence is evidence or it is fantasy. Belief doesn't enter into it. Come, Babinski, let's leave these fools to their fictions. I could die for this. Oh, nonsense. I'm surrounded on all sides by melodrama. Come. I don't think we need to go through anything as vulgar as an arrest, do you? Although I do have a rather large pistol on my person, as does Mr. Naismith. You'll need more than a pair of pistols. To do what? To... Uh, to retrieve your dignity. Stay where you are. Nickel! Nickel, look straight at the bridge. Eh? The bridge, man! Where? Not on it. The central section. Forget about the superstructure. Look! Ah, Brabant's drawings. What, what is all this, Nicole? You had a scale model of the fourth bridge destroyed at Cookshaven, Flechner. You're going to blow up the bloody bridge. I admit nothing. And you're doing it for the Tsar's benefit. You're bottling up the entire northern fleet in Versailles. <laughs> I think it is time I took my leave Don't of you. move! Hannah, where's Von Yetmar? I don't know. And Cora, where is she? Friedrich! What are you doing? Nickel is trying to arrest Professor Flechner. What? Damn. You must come and help. No, I have to go now. Helwig, Almas, prepare to cast off the launch. Where are you going? I can't tell you. Then I'm going back. No. I want you to come with me. At this time of night? It's important to me. My dress. But never mind that. Quickly. Where the hell are they? Oh, damn it. He must have gone already. Get some sailors down here. We need a boat and some armed men. Why are they all dancing? Our boat approached the towering structure of the bridge, its girders rising up to a red twilight sky from the silvery waters of the Forth. Yetmar's boat was tied to the middle caisson. We landed on the concrete island and searched for our quarry in vain until Seymour noticed an open access door at the base of the massive steel leg, rising to the railway track, almost a hundred yards above the surface of the river. John! How much longer? Ten feet or so. Come on! You'll have a gun. 
So have we. Give us a hand, Nicole. Come on. Oh. 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 Where the hell is he? Hey, there you are. Cora, for God's sake, get away from him. Nicole, go back. Ten minutes, and the police can have both ends of the bridge sealed off. Damn. He's got mines. It'll take more than a couple of mines to bring this thing down. Give yourself up, Jetmar! The, the Temeraire going out, followed by St. Vincent. Can't they go any faster? Damn! There's a train coming. It didn't stop at the station. Seymour, it's the munitions train from Woolwich. The timetable, Nickel. The last thing Porteous gave them before they killed him. He won't set the mines off before it arrives. We have to get to him before the train does. So? Get closer and start shooting. What about Cora? Come on. Get back! Oh, oh, I'll get onto the catwalk. Keep him busy. Stand clear, Cora. Don't risk it, Nicole! You get him, Seymour. The Northern Fleet left Rosyth safely and encountered the German High Seas Fleet in the North Sea off Berwick. The German fleet continued with what were described as summer manoeuvres and returned to its base at Wilhelmshaven. Our ships joined up with the body of the Grand Fleet in the Solent, where King Edward and Tsar Nicholas reviewed a line of warships 18 miles long. After dealing with both the civil and military police, I returned to the wardroom of the Magnificent, where Seymour had already poured two stiff pegs of naval issue. Carry on, Roberts. We won't need you. <coughs> so? Oh, I need this. Are you all right? I don't know yet. I can't think. Damn police. What have they done with Babinski? Babinski? Oh, well, nothing at all. It was only after the bridge came down that he would step in for the new Russian power group. Whoever they are. Diplomatic immunity and all that. And I suspect Fleckner won't be kept long either, as a matter of fact. What? The unfortunate incident. Madman goes berserk on bridge. Well, that's if they allow anything to come out at all. We allow anything, I should say. I suspect Carnforth would prefer his name kept out of this altogether, <laughs> since uh, he seems to have made a fool of himself buying an informer already in the pay of the Germans. It was bloody treachery. I'm afraid not. Some will see it as a patriotic initiative, unfortunately betrayed. Can't trust these foreigners an inch, you know. Well, can't you do anything? Oh, not me. Not Paul Grave either. You see, the way things are shaping up, Carnforth could well be his boss within a few years. Just wouldn't do, would it? So who are we doing all this for? Tell me. Who? <laughs> oh, Nickel. <laughs> for ourselves. <laughs> who else? <laughs> By the way, uh, someone's waiting for you on the foredeck. It's a beautiful sight, is it not, Nicole? Hannah, you stayed. I wanted to see you before I left. You could stay. How could I? Otto. Somehow. If there's war. There'll be no war, Hannah. As Seymour predicted, official reticence obscured the most embarrassing aspects of von Yetmer's infamy and the nation bent to an even greater program of rearmament. I'd like to say that Cora died in my arms, but the bullet I shot tore her heart out. I'd like to say that she died in the cause of peace, but she died that we might fight another war. Tomorrow is the last day of May, 1916. Off Jutland, we meet the German fleet in the last regatta. After that, surely there will be peace.
Regatta was written for radio by Douglas Young, with Ian Agnew as Nicol Naismith. Seymour Belitho was played by Sandy Nielsen. Admiral Palgrave by Leon Sindon. Hannah Flechner by Terry Cavers. Otto Flechner by John Shedden. Friedrich von Jetmar by Dan Gallagher. Cora Moncrief by Grace Glover. Mrs Moncrief by Harriet Bucken. Nijdanoff by Finlay Welsh. And the editor by Ralph Reich. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The pianist was Robert Pettigrew. Regatta was directed in our Edinburgh studios by Patrick Rayner, and there's another chance to hear it on Monday afternoon at two minutes past three. Well, now, here's the weather forecast for the United Kingdom for tomorrow. The day will start windy in many places, and the strongest winds probably being over central and eastern areas of England. As the day progresses, this cool wind will slowly moderate in the north and west, but many southeastern areas will remain windy until well into the afternoon. Blustery showers are expected in all areas, but they will slowly die out from the northwest, and many places will end the day dry with perhaps sunny intervals. Let's hope so. And the outlook for Monday and Tuesday mainly dry and bright at first, but parts of the north and west will slowly become more cloudy with some rain or drizzle. And that's the end of the weather forecast. This is Radio 4. BBC News at 10 o'clock. This is David Hitchinson. Mrs Thatcher, on the latest stage of her tour, has been seeing Mr Rajiv Gandhi, and there are hopes of an improvement in relations between Britain and India, with Mrs Thatcher pledging that the government will do all it can to deal with Sikh extremists here. The Foreign Secretary has ended his trip to three Eastern Bloc countries with a fresh plea for human rights in Poland. In Lebanon, the Israelis are denying that they had anything to do with the deaths of at least eight people in a Shiite village. The FA Cup holders, Everton, have won their way back to Wembley, but it's a replay for Liverpool and Manchester United. And both Scottish Cup semi-finals also ended in draws. The games in England led to more violence, with more than 150 arrests.